You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Kipping is the Assistant Professor of Astronomy at Columbia University, where he researches extrasolar planets and moons. Dr. Kipping also leads the Cool Worlds Lab at Columbia, which includes a YouTube channel and a website where you can learn about their research. Dr. Kipping's other areas of research interests also include study and characterization of transiting exoplanets, exoplanet atmospheres, Bayesian inference, population statistics and understanding stellar hosts. He is also the principal investigator of the hunt for the exomoons with Kepler HEK project. David Kipping, welcome back to the program. My pleasure to be back on. Thank you. Now, David, imagine we're walking along a beach and by pure serendipity, we come across a box. And inside that box is a bird in a quantum superposition. So we open it up and collapse its superposition and we find a black swan. What is a black swan event? A black swan event is fairly broadly interpretable, but in science, we often think of it as an event which has some profound implication. Some people have even compared COVID-19 as being a black swan event, so something that wasn't really predicted, at least not by by the majority of, of people, so it was surprising to most of us when it happened. And it has huge implications on, in our case, society with COVID-19, but I suppose more generally, it changes our thinking going forward. And so, you know, in astronomy, these black swan events are sometimes found serendipitously, you know, you're not really even expect, expecting to look for them. And when they're found, they can change the way we think about our place in the universe and the nature of astrophysical objects. So black swans span all sorts of fields. And I've been thinking about them mostly from the case of, of course, as an astronomer, how do they affect our view of the universe? Now, what's a good example in the history of astronomy of a black swan? Well, I suppose what's what's true for many black swans is that they're a black swan when they're found, which really means that they're a unique event with no precedent. But of course, over time, that categorization somewhat disappears because we start finding other examples of them. So you know, the first fast radio burst, the Lorimer burst, is perhaps a good example. I and mean, we weren't really expecting that thing. It was a very serendipitous discovery. And it's really changed the way we think about the, the night sky. I mean, there's actually some kind of amazing papers coming out of the, the CHIME experiment up in Canada that has shown just recently that these FRBs, we now know that of lots of these FRBs, fast radio bursts, And although we don't know the origin of them, what's actually physically causing them, we can now prove that they're uniformly distributed all over the sky. So what that means is if these unusual events are all over the sky, there's no preference that they come from the galactic plane, and so they must be coming from outside the galaxy. So we think the origin of FRBs, although we don't know the exact mechanism, is some extragalactic phenomena. So that's already pretty cool progress that we're making on that front, for instance. But, you know, black swans, they proliferate science. Uh, Pulsars, the first pulsar detection, I think, would be another good example. I'm I'm sure many of your viewers probably know about Oumuamua and the intrigue that that sparked when it was first detected as well. The first interstellar object. Now, in regards to, for example, a pulsar, now the detection of pulsars stands as a warning in a way. Because initially it was sort of considered maybe it might have an alien origin, something like that. And then we find out, no, absolutely not. It's, you know, spinning neutron star, which serves as a warning not to get too crazy with the alien explanation, even if it's a black swan, right? Indeed. And it's funny you mention that because that's basically true for all of the examples that I just mentioned. And another one to add to that list would be Boyajin Star. Okay, so you have FRB, FRBs, Fast Radio Bursts, Oumuamua, Pulsars, Boyajin Star. All of those are these objects that when they were first discovered, no, nobody was expecting them. And I think we could easily define them as black swan events for astronomy. They have really had huge impacts. These are very well cited, impactful papers and discoveries. Yet, at the same time, in every single case, every single case, 
there was considerable speculation about the possibility that these might be alien in origin. So the, the first pulsar was called LGM-1, sort of in a playful way by the discoverers, Benel and Hewish, and they said, you know, this might be Little Green Man 1 is what they're referring to there. I don't think they took that too seriously, but they, they did call it that for a while. Boyajin Star, of course, had a lot of speculation about it being some kind of astro engineering project by an advanced civilization that could be blocking out parts of the star or using stellar light in some kind of artificial way to process advanced machinery around the star. And then the fast radio bursts. Similarly, there was speculation that that could be high energy bursts, perhaps caused by spaceship acceleration. So, you know, when we're thinking about breakthrough Starshot, which is planning on sending spacecraft eventually, we hope, my first interstellar spacecraft out beyond the solar system. And they plan to use a giant laser to essentially power this thing at high speed. And in the same way, the fast radio burst could be leakage of such an advanced alien laser elsewhere in the universe. And then finally, Oumuamua, again, the same thing happened. Every time Oumuamua similarly had speculation that this could be some kind of alien probe that's visiting us. So every time, every time that we discover something new, the immediate reaction of maybe 90% of the astronomers is this is probably some interesting new natural phenomena, but there will always be those that you know are interested in, hey, could this actually be something artificial? And I think that's worthwhile to keep an open mind about. Oh, of course. Um, but it does highlight a problem that if you go a little too far, aliens can do anything and can explain anything. And that's sort of an awfully wide field that sort of needs to be constrained down and questions about ambiguity should be asked. Do you think that there is a way, an unambiguous way, that no one would dispute to discover alien? Absolutely. Yeah, I can I can think of several ways. If you detected a prime number sequence in radio transmission, that would be that'd be very difficult to imagine how that could happen naturally. I would I think I would accept that. If we could if we could demonstrate that was absolutely not a satellite you know, you could get a parallax of it, for instance. It was detected in two telescopes simultaneously and you could obtain a parallax. That means, you know, the distance to the source and you could prove it was 100 light years away or whatever. And you see a prime number sequence in it. That to me is pretty conclusive that this is an extraterrestrial intelligence that is sending a message our way. With Oumuamua, like if, if Oumuamua was truly an alien object, then we should be able to, maybe for the next one or the one after it, we could potentially intercept it. And we're already thinking about spacecraft that could do that. ESA is investigating an interceptor mission right now. So if we were able to intercept it, of course, and it was it was truly something artificial, you could imagine there being some pretty conclusive evidence depending on what it encounters when it arrives and sending back the imagery. And then for some of the other cases like Boyajin Star and Fast Radio Burst, that's, that's harder because they, these objects are very distant. We don't have a lot of data on those. But for Boyajin Star, I guess you'd be looking for um, kind of reprocessing of energy in a kind of artificial way. So it's possible. I think that's a harder case to get that conclusive evidence. But I certainly think in general, we, we, we have ideas that SETI could provide that unambiguous detection. And ultimately... That's the strength of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, because we are also looking for life through other means, for instance, by the biology, the biosignatures that life produces. And there we are quite concerned about the possibility of ambiguity. So, for instance, oxygen, which is thought to be a biosignature on the Earth, because otherwise it should just oxidize, it should just disappear over a few million years. It really shouldn't hang around in an atmosphere. Something's making it. In, that, in our case, it's life. But if you look at an exoplanet, it is possible that oxygen could be produced abiotically, for instance, by a process called photolysis, which happens in the upper atmosphere, where water gets very high up in the atmosphere, and then UV light splits it into oxygen and into hydrogen. And the hydrogen can escape because it's very light. It kind of floats off into space, and it leaves you with a very oxygen-heavy atmosphere. So this can happen, for instance, if the star goes through a UV intensive period. And so there's there's uh, you know, there's always ways that we can imagine with lots of these biological signatures of of tricking us, because how do we know all of the alien geology? I mean, our geology is very limited. We've only studied the few planets in our solar system. So how do we really have a complete knowledge of all of the ways which this this chemistry can happen? But for looking for an alien signature, as I said, you see a message encoded, you download the plans to build your warp drive. 
from, from a radio message. And that's pretty unambiguous that there, there is someone sending you information that we do not have access to and is coming from an artificial distant transmitter somewhere. So I think that that has always been the strength to me of SETI is the potential, the potential to be unambiguous. But of course, there are many cases where it will not be. Now, the ambiguity of biosignatures, as you were you were talking about, the one saving grace there is that at least there are new methods, new thinking to sort of verify it. So if you see oxygen and these things that may indicate photosynthesis on that planet, you can also look for the vegetative red edge just to see. And so you might have several ways to remove the ambiguity, right? That's right. The red edge is pretty tricky to get. It was, of course, detected on the Earth by one of our remote satellites. That's where sort of the idea of the Red Edge first came around. I think that was actually uh, one of S Carl Sagan's ideas to to look for that Red Edge. So we, yeah, certainly if you had a Red Edge, you had an oxygen signature, maybe you might even see evidence for, for methane and other chemicals which shouldn't be present in the atmosphere. You might be able to eventually build up a, a deeper picture. Now we're a little bit way off that at the moment. So when we, you know, when we're talking about looking for biosignatures, we're fairly limited in our ability, at least right now. The James Webb Space Telescope, when it hopefully launches successfully, in principle by the end of this year, will be pretty much our first telescope, which has. A, a remote chance, and it is quite a remote chance of being able to pull that off. So if you just take pretty much the very, very best case scenario possible, it could just about, using a huge portion of its observing time, have a chance at detecting that. But going forward, we're hoping on building upon that success and maybe having something like Louvois or Habex, which are going to directly image these Earth-like planets. And there we would be resolving the light of the planet itself and would see basically pale blue dots, you know, directly. It'd be like a single pixel image, but it'd be a pale blue dot that we'd be looking at. And from that dot, you'd be able to extract the spectra and see the evidence of the oxygen. I think the red edge, as far as I'm aware, is a little bit beyond the ability of even those next-gen telescopes. But sure, if we, I'm sure if we saw oxygen in the atmosphere, funding would probably open up to build that next generation version as well, right? Because if we can find some tentative evidence for life, then there's more impetus to make that next step and build the next mission. One thing that I've always uh, endlessly chewed over in my head is the likelihood of, of intelligent life versus microbial life. And my own preferred solution to the Fermi paradox is that we live in a largely microbial universe. And that is only does it get further just by chance, you know, for example, the leap to from prokaryotic to eukaryotic life on Earth, which took 1.8 billion years to happen. Mm -hmm. So that's my, my, my own personal thing, thinking is that, you know, intelligent life is rare and microbial life is not. So do we have much of a chance detecting a planet like early Earth with the anaerobic bacteria and all those sort of a profile of gases, you know, before oxygenation, or is it just hopeless? I, I think that's a really, a really long stretch that we'd be able to pull it off, to be honest with you. If there's no, I mean, when you're looking at this very simple life, it, it really eats up, it has a very small bioproductivity. So it's not really affecting the planet in a significant way. And really our ability to detect life is the fact that it's essentially altering the entire planet on a very significant scale. And that's how we're able to detect it. Now, if you don't have the ability to have photosynthesis, which ultimately is responsible for the oxygen, then that's going to greatly diminish the amount of energy resource that's available to you, because then you're basically competing for chemical energy which is a finite resource. And there might be some, you know, maybe you can imagine using some of the radioactivity energy within the planet, some of the chemical energy that's within the deep sea vents, but that's a far more limited resource. And so the ability of, of life to then influence the entire planet is naturally going to be much smaller. So look, we, we don't know all the answers to this because we only really have examples of life that we've looked at here on the earth and we can, and we're trying to extrapolate forward. But my guess would be that just from an energetic perspective, if you can't achieve photosynthesis, which is ultimately, in our case, what leads to oxygen, then that's going to really limit your ability to create a detectable signal. And so you might be right, there could be plenty of living worlds out there just in a primordial manner compared to that of our own. And so 
unfortunately, they're basically invisible to us. And the only way to get at those would probably be to do something like break through Starshot. I mean, I really think that visitation eventually has to be sort of the only way to get those kind of absolute slam dunk detections and not only a detection, but to actually understand the biosphere of those worlds. It's very, very difficult to do that completely remotely and just look at the solar system for that. I mean, there's only so much you can learn about Jupiter and Saturn through the Hubble Space Telescope, you can learn some impressive things about the clouds, but really until you plunge through the atmosphere and start sampling the gases and using a mass spectrometer, visiting the moons and, you know, doing fly-throughs of the moons, of the of the plumes as they as they erupt and things like this, you're you're really limited in just how much you can see from a great distance. And so I think if the universe is teeming with extremely simple life we for all intents and purposes to us it would probably appear as if there's no life out there for a very long time that's sort of poetic isn't it that <laughs> that the potentially most common form of life in the universe is essentially undetectable at a distance i mean in a way it has to be easier to produce simple life than complex life. So, I mean, that's that's fairly unambiguous. The question is, how often does the simple life then have an opportunity to, to develop into more sophisticated life? And that seems to be really a process limited in our case by the the amount of useful work that's present in, in light itself. So, you know, we have to think of the energy from the star and there's this idea of the habitable zone. So as you go to a certain distance around the star, around different types of stars, you get the same amount of total energy hitting your planet as we receive per unit time. But that's but it's not necessarily useful energy. So, I mean, the cosmic microwave background is basically completely useless energy. It's very difficult to do work with that because it's just so cold. It's very The photons have very, very little energy per photon. And so you kind of get stuck in thermodynamics rules and Carnot efficiency rules that basically stop you from extracting useful work. The most useful photons are high energy photons where you can extract a lot of work from them. And so there's a lot of thinking that, you know, it's it's not just a question of, you know, when it comes to this process of life getting more sophisticated, one of the ingredients might be the flavor of the light itself that it's absorbing. And so stars, which are like the sun, are pretty energetic. I mean, this is almost the basis of the Superman <laughs> premise, right? Like he absorbs the light. It kind of, kind of has that kind of spin on it. But we think of stars like the sun and even stars, what we'd call an F-type star, which is a, a, even a star which is more massive than the sun, producing much more high-energy photons. And then you compare that to stars like red dwarfs, which I've been thinking about a lot recently, which, yes, you can go to a certain distance where the same amount of energy is the same, but is photosynthesis really possible if all of the photons are red? I mean, there's, there's just less of that useful part of the spectrum that you're absorbing, which photosynthesis needs to ultimately conduct the chemical reactions that's going on inside the leaves, inside the cells. And, I mean, a, a kind of a simple example is the famous photoelectric effect. You can shine a huge amount of low energy radiation onto a metal rod and nothing's going to happen. But as you tune up the frequency to the high energy photons to get to the UV light, you start flying electrons off. And so it's really the, the frequency of light, which is also quite important. So that may be, you know, another part of the puzzle. And then there's this kind of paradox that, okay, if you want a long lived period for evolution to happen, then you'd think about going to a red dwarf because they live so much longer. So red dwarfs, they live a long time, but they put out pitiful amounts of high energy radiation. And then you go to the stars which are more massive than the sun, these F-type stars, O, B, A-type stars. They produce certainly plenty of energy for photosynthesis. That's great. But they don't live very long. They actually, Because you know the, the candle that burns twice as bright burns half as long. And so these stars basically extinguish themselves within a billion years or less. And so there just isn't enough time, even if even if photosynthesis is alive and kicking and going great, the complex sequence of events of all of these evolutionary steps, as you mentioned, just is a is time limited. It just doesn't have enough years go by to get to those sophisticated machineries that it needs to. So, you know, that, that could be another possible way to look at this Fermi paradox problem is that there is just a sweet spot in terms of the star that we live around, a habitable star type rather than necessarily a habitable planet. Now, let's uh, let's talk for a moment about that star types. Now, a type F star, an example being Tabby star, as I recall, was type F. Yeah. These don't live that long, but they've got they've got time. They they live long enough maybe for life to arise around them. But at the same time, 
are they just too active? I mean, too energetic? Is there anything that stands in the way other than time for an F-type star to support life? I don't think so. I mean, in terms of activity, so kind of the interesting thing about these, when you look at an interesting rule of thumb with these stars, is that the um, more massive they are, the shorter they live. And everything, if, if they live a shorter amount of time than us, then everything happens quicker. And one of the key processes in in, in the life cycle of a star is when it's basically what we say maybe going through its adolescence and just like a, a teenager a human teenager can be pretty wild and you know chaotic stars similarly go through that episode when they're you know soon after their formation when they're so-called settling onto the main sequence they are significantly more active than they are for the rest of the time a bit more episodic they're not very stable so that's a that's a time when it would be difficult for life to persist necessarily. It could it could be we have reasons to believe that might not be the best time for life to be surviving. But the good news is with an F-type star that that goes through pretty quick and it happens quicker than the sun. So, you know, clearly however it lasted for probably a order of 10 to, you know, maybe tens of millions millions of years for the sun. But that process happens even quicker than that for these F-type stars and clearly that wasn't a barrier for life on the earth. So, we don't have any good reason to think it would be a barrier for F-type stars. On the other hand, for M dwarfs, the exact opposite is true. Those that adolescence period can last for a billion years. And that's a long time. And a billion years of that kind of chaotic, high energy behavior could be enough to desiccate the planet altogether. So you could imagine a planet that acquires water, the Earth you know, probably acquired water either through comets or even perhaps through sequestration inside the Earth actually coming out, the water it was had in situ essentially. But as that water arrives onto the surface, it basically gets desiccated through this, this adolescent period of these stars. And then you end up with dune worlds you know, just dry deserts. And then it's really difficult, as far as, we, as far as we can see on the Earth, for life to thrive in an environment that is completely depleted of water. So that might be uh, an, a, a part of the puzzle. But I think with F-dwarfs, F I really don't see any obvious barrier. They seem to often have planets. They seem to often have Jupiter-like planets. You know, the Jupiter, some people have speculated, could be uh, helpful for the emergence of complex life because it's sort of a perhaps an asteroid shield in the outer solar system. M dwarfs again don't have those <laughs> very often. So as far as we can tell, there's nothing wrong with F type stars. But even since the days of Carl Sagan in the 70s, you know, he was arguing that we should not probably be targeting F dwarfs just because they are so short lived. I mean. I say so short-lived, it's like a billion and a half years or so, depending on ex exactly the subtype you're looking at. But it's it's obviously far shorter than the Earth. It took about 4.4 billion years on the Earth to go from liquid water on the surface to us, right? That's the time scale, four, basically four and a half billion years. And these M dwarfs live for about a, th uh, F dwarfs, sorry, live for about a third of that time. So it, you'd have to have some kind of very accelerated process of evolution to get to, I mean, we didn't even have multicellular life on the Earth after 1.5 billion years. Is, and there's no oxygen, there's no photosynthesis, you don't have eukaryote cells. So you're, you'd really have to have a very accelerated evolutionary process. It's not impossible, that could happen in rare instances perhaps, but it's, it seems a stretch for life to pull that off given what we see have happened on the Earth. Do F-type stars uh, do the same thing as our type G sun with increasing luminosity with age. Yeah, pretty much all stars do that as they age. And that's essentially just as they're sort of depleting their hydrogen, the hydrogen burning shell starts to move out from the from the core of the star, and that makes the exterior get hotter and hotter. And of course, the star actually expands a little bit as a result as well. So that's part of the reason why the luminosity is increasing. So yeah, event, I mean, the the, uh, the sun has increased in luminosity by about 30% since the Earth first formed. Similarly, these stars uh, will will go through a similar, it is predicted, a similar degree of um, change in luminosity over their lifetimes. Now let's go to type G. Is it possible in comparison to type K? We won't get to the red dwarfs quite yet. Let's Let's look at the orange ones. Is it possible that the sun is actually not an ideal star for life to form around, it just happened to do it while it could, and that we really should be looking at type K. Yeah, there's there's certainly a lot of uh, my colleagues who are really interested in these, you know, these so-called orange dwarfs, the the K-type stars, because they they do seem to have a lot of things going for them. They have longer lives first and foremost. That gives you a greater period of you know potential adaptation. 
complex evolution to happen on the surface. Yet more, they seem to have sufficient energy within their photons. I mean, technically, this term is actually called exergy, to introduce the technical term to use. That's sort of the amount of useful work that's contained within the light. So they thought to have sufficient exergy for, for photosynthesis to occur quite happily. And they, they seem to very commonly have planets as well. So, yeah, there's lots of re- We can't really find any reason why K-dwarfs would be um, in any way worse than G-type stars, no obvious reason. And the fact that they just are more common and you know, the smaller the star is, basically, the more common they are. It's just kind of easier, you know, with star formation, it's easier to make a small thing than a big thing. And so there's just more and more small stars and big ones. So there's more of these K-dwarfs and sun-like stars. And because they are a little bit smaller, they burn their fuel a little bit slower. And so they should last longer. And so that also gives you plenty of time for that evolutionary process to take place. So, yeah, that's an interesting one. And I think um, if you were going to design a survey that was targeting a very, very specific type of star, you might even prefer K-stars over sun-like stars. Now, part of me is resistant to saying that because, well, we know there's life on the sun so that's surely we should you know around the sun so surely that's an obvious choice to go for a sun like star but the advantage of a k dwarf from an observational perspective from an astronomer's perspective is that because they're a little bit smaller and a little bit lighter it makes it easier for us to study their planets so for example the probably the most successful method we have of studying planets right now is to use the transit method and that's when the planet passes over the front of the star blocks out some of the light i'm sure many of you have heard of this technique quite a bit by now and as the star shrinks smaller and smaller in size if the planet is the same size so keep the planet the same size as the earth if i make the star smaller and smaller that's going to make the amount of light the planet blocks out increase And so the more light the planet blocks out, the easier it is for us to tease out these tiny signals around them, whether that be the atmosphere of the planet or even more sophisticated technological signatures, such as a satellite system. We could detect their, potentially, their Starlink if we had a sufficiently precise photometer to to do that. We could actually detect the satellites in orbit of of the planet. And having a smaller star makes that easier. So, yeah, I can certainly understand why lots of my colleagues are very keen on chasing down those orange dwarfs as maybe our best chance. And then finally, we come to the red dwarfs. Can you give us an overview of the red sky paradox? Yeah, the red sky paradox is something that's really bothered me for a long time. I know I'm not the only one to be bugged by it. And many speaking to many of my colleagues, we've sort of had this feeling as well. And I guess it kind of stems from what I was just saying, that the smaller the star is, the easier it is to study. And so for years, because of that, we've been really focused on looking for planets and eventually even life. Many of the missions we're thinking about building are designed and strategized to look for life around these very, very small stars. That's just because the the signature of of life is enhanced, essentially, around these things because of the the smaller star size. But the problem with that is, um, if you think about it, if you're going to invest... $10 $10 billion in a mission which can really exclusively look, let's hypothetically exclusively look at these red dwarf stars. There's something almost counterintuitive about that because you don't live around one. And that surely you should focus on things where you know at least life is successful. And this, so that there's a big economic gamble happening when you choose which type of star to look at. So this is why this actually does have some, it's not just a philosophical point, this idea really has some practical implications. Now, the Red Sky Paradox really just points out three things which are odd. If we're really going to gamble on red dwarfs, here's three odd things about these about these objects. One, they are significantly more numerous than sun-like stars. Depends exactly how you how, where you draw the line in the sand to classify these things, but they're at least uh, several times, five times I, I put in the paper drawing a line between. I used M dwarfs as one type and FGKs I bucket together as sun-like stars. Um, So they're five times more common than F, G, and K combined. And then they live far longer as well. So the very smallest ones can live for trillions of years, even 10 trillion years in some cases. They'll be the last stars to burn in the universe. Whereas sun-like stars only have basically about 5 billion years where there are conditions within the habitable zone which are conducive to life. Uh, the sun will last about twice that. The age of the sun will, in total will be about 10 billion years. But as, we, as we've already talked about, as it evolves and changes over time, it becomes less and less hospitable for life. So there's about 5 billion years of op- a window of opportunity for life around the Earth to emerge. And 
it, and, and intelligence to emerge. And clearly it happened here because we're here to talk about it. But it happened at a time scale of 4.4 billion years, right? So it's almost at the very end of the window of opportunity. You have 5 billion years to, to get life and we or intelligence. And we emerged at 4.4. So we're pretty close to the finish line, right? If we if we if that process took just a little bit longer, we wouldn't even be here to talk about it. And maybe it typically does happen much much longer than that. And we're just that tail end of the distribution where it happened unusually quick, in fact, compared to the average. Now, if whenever you're thinking about an evolutionary process, that of course the longer you have, the easier it is going to be to get a success. And so just the virtue of the fact these M dwarfs live so long means that really they have everything going for them you would think in terms of eventually culminating in intelligent civilizations around them of which we are clearly an example so then it's kind of odd that we don't live around one and you might think as as i think many of us banked on until fairly recently that perhaps they just don't have many planets that would seem to solve the problem so i don't think anybody really talked about this before because we didn't really know how often they had planets and that could clearly be a very obvious solution if they just don't have planets as often as sun-like stars which we certainly had reasons to speculate about they're smaller so there's less mass around them less mass to build planets from then that would actually make sense and that perhaps resolves why we don't live around one they just don't have planets very often to begin with but they actually appear to very often have planets around them in fact they seem to if anything have rocky planets in the temperate zone that's suitable for life even more often than sun-like stars do as far as we can tell now we haven't probed the entire spectrum of every m dwarf type yet the very very smallest m dwarfs are still pretty elusive to us they're very hard to look at but certainly for the mid-size and the heavier m dwarfs they seem to have a, an overwhelming abundance of planets so these three facts the sheer abundance of m dwarfs the long lives which you know, in principle, should just be beneficial to the emergence of intelligence over time. And the fact that, you know, these stars really, as far as we can tell, have as many planets as sun-like stars, if not more. These three things kept me awake at night, let's say. <laughs> and I was, and I, was, I was perturbed by the fact that we didn't live around one. And so I wanted to calculate just how improbable that would be, you know, what is the chance of being an observer around a yellow star, uh, a yellow dwarf, I should really say, versus a red star, and it turns out to be about 100 to 1. So this is kind of the premise of the paradox, that by a paradox is really defined as a situation where you get a result which goes against expectation. And by all expectation, according to our current knowledge of stellar astrophysics, which is you know, fairly advanced, like we know about a lot of stars at this point, we know about all the planets around them. It's pretty surprising, given what we can see, that, you know, we would happen to live around a, a yellow dwarf star. Doesn't that, if, if it continues to hold that red dwarfs commonly have planets, lots of them, I mean, look at the Trappist-1 system, if that holds, doesn't that create another mystery in that why aren't red dwarfs more massive if, it, if they had all this material to work with as far as forming planets go? Why aren't the planets more massive? Is that what you're asking? No, if, if it's got a lot of material to form a lot of planets, why is the star a red dwarf at all? Why isn't, isn't it more massive? You know, why wasn't there enough gas to make it into an orange dwarf or something? Yeah, okay, so you, yeah, I see what you mean. So you're trying to relate, maybe if we add up the mass of the planets, does that imply something about the mass of the star that it should be orbiting around? Right. Possibly, but we don't know that the process of planet formation is a continuum or even or even particularly homogenous across the different star types. So when you look at the planets around Trappist-1, just as, as you mentioned as an example, they are very different to the solar system because you have seven sub-Earth-sized planets, all of them, which are packed together in these incredibly tight orbits. And they live in a this enormous, what's called a Laplacian resonance chain, which we only have really a couple of examples of that in the solar system, with the most famous example being the Galilean satellites. And in fact, when you look at the sort of the, the sizes and the way they're distributed around their star, they look much more like a moon system than they do a planet system. It's really like taking Jupiter and scaling it up rather than taking the solar system and scaling it down. They don't have 
um, a super, you know, a super Earth or a mini Neptune hanging out in the outer solar system. So it may be that it just, you know, there's some uh, threshold for the mass within the disk, which is necessary to get to this point where you can form basically runaway accretion and get to these cores, which then can accrete gas. And that you lead to a very different type of planet. But if you don't get to that point where you can build cores which are large enough to accrete hydrogen gas, then eventually the star just blows all the gas away and then you're wasting that mass. So the mass doesn't get used for planet formation in the first place. So that's why you might end up thinking it should be a K star because you you just don't know about all the mass that it lost because the star was inefficient. It didn't use that mass to build planets. It blew it away because there was never a core big enough to accrete that that gas in the first place. So I think we have to be kind of cautious when we compare these very late, M, you know, these very small M dwarfs compared to the sun, just because the I think the process of planet formation appears to be related, but happening through kind of some distinct pathways. In regards to our own aging sun becoming less and less friendly towards life as it gets older, we're eventually going to have to deal with that if we're still here. Mm. And that would mean presumably moving somewhere is a red dwarf system one that's calmed down that's going to last for a very long time is that a natural place to look for techno signatures yeah that's a really interesting angle so and i think people have been, have, been, have thought about this a little bit as well that the idea that this may be the refuges at the end of the universe essentially that once all the sunlight stars burn themselves through the only energy source left you know whether you like it or not is the M dwarf stars. And so it's just that it's the natural place where you might, I mean, the only other option I, I suppose might be some kind of exotic star, like a black hole, where you can perhaps imagine extracting energy through things like the halo drive, which I've talked about over on my channel before and written about. But yeah, I think the most obvious thing would be to head to Proxima Centauri because that's right next door, right? That's an M dwarf that's right on our doorstep. It'd be an obvious place to head to. Because that's a very, very challenging feet to, to move an entire civilization many many light years of course we can't even move a microchip that far at the moment um, and it's not the only option i mean there's there's ways that you could perhaps engineer the sun which might be easier as it turns out than moving an entire star um, for instance uh, greg laughlin a professor at yale has suggested that it could be possible to modify the earth's orbit and push it out and the way you would do this is basically fling asteroids at the earth which sounds pretty precarious at first to throw them at the earth but you don't throw them directly at the earth you just miss they slingshot essentially around the earth and they exchange momentum with the earth and they push the earth's orbit a little bit out and so you could through a process of flinging lots and lots of asteroids just redirecting them you could sort of paint one side of the asteroid white and the other side black just to add this kind of slight light pressure effect which changes their angle of attack in the solar system and eventually if you're very precise with it it's a pretty precarious operation you could move the orbit of the earth back and that that would buy you a bit of time i mean it's not going to buy you infinite time of course but it might buy you maybe a billion or two years, which let's face it on human time scales would be enormous. And then even more generally, you might, uh, I, I've sort of been thinking about this, I don't have a paper on this at the moment, but it's certainly something I'm thinking about is could you actually pull, pull mass off the star itself? If you could pull mass off the sun, you would basically turn it into an M dwarf. You could just you know, remove uh, mass very slowly over time. We see mass transfer happen quite often in astrophysical systems. So if you have a white dwarf star part next to a, a giant star, the white dwarf will accrete. Mass will flow from the giant star onto the surface of the white dwarf. And that actually can often spark a supernova if you're not careful when you do it too fast. You get too much mass building up on the surface of the white dwarf. But we know that this happens astrophysically, that mass can move between stars. You can basically use like a vacuum cleaner and suck up the mass. And so, you know, maybe there is some artificial black hole that might be constructed or something which could actually reduce the mass of the sun effectively. It's still basically the same gravitational mass because you'd be moving mass from a luminous body into basically this empty black hole which isn't really doing anything in terms of luminosity. And so you would be able to dial back the power output of the sun. You could do it in such a way that you kind of, you, you de-age the sun basically. You keep it at the same luminosity by just as it's trying to age up and become more luminous, you're peeling off mass at the equal and opposite rate to keep its output the same. That's, a, again, a pretty sci-fi idea. 
But I know, of course, on this channel, uh, it's always fun to talk about sci-fi ideas with you, John. And I think that's something I'm kind of interested in exploring is, is what would that look like? Could we detect that? Would a civilization perhaps uh, consider doing such a thing? Turning the sun into a red dwarf. Now, before we go on, I want to point everybody to your uh, YouTube channel, Cold Worlds Lab, where you have actually quite a few videos up nowadays, right? I mean... Yeah, yeah. We, I'm trying to post over the summer. I'm trying to post every couple of weeks. Probably not. Uh, I'm a, I probably won't post next week just because I'm on a NASA panel review that I'm doing. But yeah, in general, we're, we're aiming to post every two to three weeks. Now, to get back into this idea of altering the sun, engineering the sun, has anybody put in thought what you would do with the helium uh, as the sun ages? And if you wanted to, say, convert it over to a red dwarf, assuming it would be convective like a red dwarf, what do you do with the helium? Yeah, I mean, that's just ash. That's that's building up in the core over time. The beauty of an M dwarf versus a sun-like star, though, is that they are significantly more efficient. So sun-like stars, essentially, they can really only burn the fuel which is in their core, and that's it. Um, they don't have access to the hydrogen, which is in the outer envelopes, just because there's basically so much radiation pressure inside the core that there's no flow. There's no way it, it'd be like having a wind turbine and expecting you know to throw a ping pong ball back in the opposite direction of that wind blowing into your face. The hydrogen on the surface just can't get back down to the center. There's no way for it to get back down. And so the sun, sun like stars, only really burn the hydrogen fuel that's right deep in the center of the core, and they're converting it into helium ash over time. And once that depletes, then they become these giant stars. Now for later type stars, in particular once you get to these M dwarfs, they can become what's called fully convective, which means the radiative, you know, the core is getting less and less luminous as you as you have less and less pressure in the center. And so eventually that wind that wind tunnel that you're sort of the ping pong ball is trying to be thrown against uh, dials down enough that hydrogen on the outer surface can eventually over hundreds of thousands of years, which is actually hardly anything on the time scale of a star, cycle round and uh, make it to the core and be used as fuel. And so it's thought that M dwarf stars, one of the reasons they're so, or at least predicted to be so long lived, is because of this fully convective property. They, they mix all of the material around in a much more efficient way. So you'd still have that helium ash burning there. M dwarfs surely do have plenty of helium ash burning in their cores, but they also have access to much more hydrogen fuel than, than sun-like stars do. Now that has to be a very obvious, unambiguous, long-term, very long-term techno signature. If you see a star turning into a red dwarf along with its planet being migrated inward, <laughs> and you watch this over 100,000 years, so your telescope never turns off, you're probably found an alien civilization, right? You'd think so. And in fact, you'd actually, uh, just to correct you that, you don't even have to move the planet because you're, you're keeping the luminosity of the star the same here. So you're just, as the, you know, you get to this tipping point, maybe for the Earth, it will happen in about, um, let's see, about sort of 0.7 billion years, 700 million years or so. So in about 700 million years, we build some kind of black hole, let's say, hypothetically, or could even be a neutron star or some kind of quark star matter around this, around nearby close to the part to the sun. And it starts to accrete material. You get Roche lobe overflow. And uh, you just basically do it in such a way that you're, you're resisting the sun's urge to become more luminous. It wants to increase, uh, you know, its luminosity over time, and you're basically reducing the pressure in the oven by peeling mass off to keep it the same output level. So you don't even have to move the Earth. Now, what would that look like? I mean, of course, we think we can detect. I think then you basically turn the sun into a binary star, right? So you have, in the scenario I've described just there, where you have a black hole part right next to it, the sun would wobble around a lot as a result of that. It wouldn't really affect our climate in a significant way, I don't think, because the you know it's still so close to the to the sun, and we certainly know of many circumbinary planets. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a, a natural barrier necessarily, but it would give you this wobble effect that you could potentially detect. So we can certainly detect binary stars that way, and you would uh, have kind of a curious case where you may even be able to detect the Roche lobe overflow, the mass loss rate. And you'd see the mass loss rate was kind of in this fine-tuned regime where it was just enough to keep the sun basically the same 
uh, luminosity all the time, which would seem kind of coincidental. And you might notice that the companion was really too small to be a black hole by as far as we understand naturally. So black holes should only really form naturally if they're above sort of 10 solar masses. There's a few actually examples, maybe you can get a little bit more than that, like five solar masses and some examples of that coming out of LIGO. But you certainly can't form Earth mass black holes naturally because there's, you know, Earth, the Earth's mass will just never have enough gravitational pressure to self-collapse into a black hole. So you'd have to manufacture such a thing. And you know, there's been speculation about doing that in particle colliders and even perhaps primordial black holes could be an example of su such an exotic object which could have formed very, very, very early in the universe. Um, but these things, as far as we can tell, aren't formed as a natural product of stellar evolution. So that would also be pretty suspicious that you'd had a solar mass black hole, which really by all rights shouldn't exist, that is leads to a mass accretion rate, which is just right to keep the star the same luminosity. So as I said, this isn't anything I've written up yet. So we're really brainstorming this together, John. I appreciate that. And uh, I think that would be a kind of a fun idea to explore a little bit more. Now, in such a system where you have a very small black hole and a star, is that any use for the halo drive or do you just need really a bigger pair of black holes in a binary configuration to do it? Yeah, for the halo drive, the mass of the black hole isn't particularly important. Um, it's the angular momentum that you're interested in. So if you want to get a lot of energy out of the thing, it's, the, it's either the spin, it needs to be spinning very fast, or it needs to be in a binary and it's revolving around its companion very, very fast. Now, if you if you put it around the sun, I mean, I'd have to look at the numbers, but my guess is that you wouldn't get that up to relativistic speeds because it would have to be, you know, the way you get relativistic speeds of black holes really is that you put them within just a few event horizons of each other. And so they're so close that just by sort of imagining the penny going down, you've ever seen those kind of penny drops where they kind of spin round and round and speed up as they go closer and closer in. It's the same thing with orbits. The closer the orbit, the faster things revolve. So if you want to get those very high speeds, you want to put things really, really tight together. And just the fact that the black hole necessarily would have to be outside of the sun's radius would already be quite a significant distance by black hole standards. And so I think you would end up with speeds that would not be I mean, you'd still be able to extract energy out of it. You, you would actually be able to recover some energy from the system, but I don't think you would be able to use it to propel to relativistic speeds in that particular scenario. Back to black swans and their relation to techno signatures. We have one seemingly, the wow signal. Could you characterize how the wow signal is a black swan? Yeah, the wow signal is, you know, the type of signal that is truly fascinating to me. It's surely the best SETI signal we've ever seen. And it still today, despite many decades of looking at it, defies any obvious explanation. So yeah, I really recommend, as I said on my on my channel, that you know everybody listening should listen to your interview with Jerry Eman to learn all about the background of that object. But it's, it is essentially an anomalous radio signature that has many of the characteristics that we would expect to happen from an alien radio transmission has kind of the right frequency that we would expect. It was kind of this short-lived signal that, you know, maybe makes sense from a beacon perspective. There's been some work by Gregory Benford, who's been arguing that, you know, the most energy efficient strategy would be just to sort of pulse these short pulses to say hello to people. And it kind of has many of those characteristics. There's no obvious terrestrial explanation. You know, we don't know of any satellites or anything that were in the way that could have produced this. So everything about it looks pretty good, except for the fact it is a black swan, by which I mean there's no repetition. As, you know, no one's detected a recurrence of this thing. And so that's really frustrating because if you have a one-off, it's, it's really kind of a stretch to then say, well, that means there must be alien life in the universe. You have to kind of make a few leaps of faith to, to go from a one-off to that. If we saw this thing repeat over and over again, we come back and it has some kind of sequence that we could decode. Maybe there's some information embedded within that that we could, we could pull out by studying the signal at higher fidelity. Then, of course, you could make you'd have much greater confidence that this was an artificial signal or not. I mean, maybe you would determine it was some kind of astrophysical signal that just that is on a natural repeating cycle that's associated with the period of a binary star that's located close to where it was coming from or something. 
So yeah, that's the problem with it. The, the the black swan is both paradoxically, it's kind of intrigue level is very high because the fact we don't see it again, it gives you the opportunity to dream, to fill in the blanks and imagine what it might be. But at the same time, it's frustrating because it's very difficult to figure out what it is. And another kind of semi example of it, I don't think it's quite as strong, would be the breakthrough listening candidate one signal that was uh, detected last year. Again, there you have this kind of narrow band radio pulse at the kind of frequencies that you would expect for radio transmission. Again, there we don't have an obvious explanation. It, it looks more likely that case is terrestrial just because the frequency is like a very specific integer number of megahertz, and there's no reason why aliens should use our exact megahertz frequency scale. So that immediately is kind of a suspicious thing about that frequency. But in both cases, there's just one-offs. Part of the work I've been doing, and I wrote about in this Black Swan paper, was trying to figure out, okay, let's assume this thing has some recurrence time, that maybe it's a million years, maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's 10 seconds, who knows, it has some recurrence time. I don't know what the recurrence time is, but I can sort of parameterize it mathematically. And then I can ask, what is the most likely recurrence time, given that it took me so long to detect the event? So in the case of the wow signal, I think it was just three days, if you look at the observing logs, that it took them. It was part of a nine-day run, they had this initial nine-day run, and on the third day, they detected the signal. And so just based off the fact, you know, if you were waiting for a bus, you turned up down the road, you're waiting for a bus and you arrive at some arbitrary time, you start your stopwatch and then it takes 30 minutes for the first bus to arrive. You might reasonably guess that the time scale for buses to arrive is something like once every 30 minutes. It's probably not once every millennium because it'd be kind of odd that you would, you turned up and within 30 minutes a bus turned up if it really did repeat once every millennium. And likewise, it's probably not once per minute because otherwise 30 buses should have arrived reasonably by the time you were stood there for. So just the time it took from when the observations start to when you got the first success, that that information alone encodes some information, not a lot, but a little bit of information about the probabilistic guess for what the repeat time of this signal would be. And so I've been working on a theory to sort of use this to apply to the wow signal and many of the cases. But it has to be said, I mean, that would be really useful information to apply to a future search for the wow signal. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think this is important for all of these black swan events is when you detect them, the immediate question, as we've already motivated is, well, let's try and get another. Let's try and see it again, because, it's, you know, that would really be the, the way to a prove this is real. But B, just more learn about the population of objects. I mean, if it's Oumuamua's, then you want to find more and more Oumuamua's to see, well, do they all have that shape? Do they all have, do they all do that kind of weird acceleration thing at like the solar system on the back end? Or uh, do they all have similar colors? You want to get a sample of them to understand more. And so, yeah, for astronomers, it's a very natural thing. I think probably just a very human thing to ask when you see a one-off is, okay, how long do I have to wait until I see it again? And so using this, mathematical framework that I described can actually sort of give you a prediction for that. And it ends up being fairly simple. The sort of the, the takeaway result, if you like, would be that if you detected a signal after waiting for a time, let's call it T1, time T1, then there's a 50% chance you will see it happen a second time if you wait another T1. So that kind of makes sense. You know, you wait twice as long, well, at really the same time again, then you get a 50% chance of seeing it again. But if you want to get up to a higher confidence level for that, because 50%, that's, you know, that's, you know, at the end of the day, that's 50-50. It's a toss of a coin. Who, you know, that's not very satisfying. What if I want to design a survey with a very high confidence of detecting it a second time? So let's say I, I scale it up to 90%. What do I have to do? How long do I have to wait to get a 90% chance of seeing this thing repeat? Well, then you have to survey for at least nine times as long as you did the first time around. You have to wait nine times as long. And if you want to get up to 95% confidence, just 5% more, you have to increase from nine times to 99 times. So it gets kind of exponentially worse. Like every time you want to increase your confidence just a little bit, there's kind of a mathematical cost that gets exponentially worse, as it turns out. And so the rule of uh, the rule of thumb from this for me would be that black swans demand a lot of patience and that you can observe the wow signal for a hundred times longer. You can do, you know, rather than just doing that nine day run, you could do a 900 day run on the thing 
and still not see it repeat again. And still there's a 1% chance that you just, actually a 5% chance to crit myself, a 5% chance that it is repeating and you just missed it. And, you know, that really changes the game because I think most people would assume if you looked for a hundred times longer than the initial run, that's conclusive, but it, it's not conclusive for black swans. Now, my final question for you is sort of something that, that I've been wondering about. So, Umuamua, all right, we're expecting to see a population of them once the Vera Rubin Observatory is online. Mm -hmm. what, would it, what would the implications be if we never saw another object like it and it becomes another WoW signal? Yeah, I mean, in a way, we kind of already have an example of something similar. There's certainly another interstellar object, which uh, the Borisov object, which was discovered. So we do know of another interstellar object. It's pretty different in composition. It's much more cometry-like, I believe, than Oumuamua. But yes, yeah, so if you want an object that truly had similar properties to Oumuamua, and that would be a sample of one at this time, because you could exclude Borisov, I think, by certain arguments. So what would it mean if you never saw it again? It'd be difficult to explain that with the framework, at least that we've developed with this black swan theory, because it sort of depends what you mean by ne by what you mean by never. Ultimately, if you waited for infinite time, it'd be it'd be really difficult to imagine that you'd never see an interstellar asteroid in infinite time. I mean, really, that has an infinitesimal probability, technically, of, of happening. So it's really a question of how how much effort have you gone to, where you didn't see it happen again, and you know I think once you get to the uh, I threw around some numbers there, like 95% confidence, 90% confidence. But if you got to a point where it was like 99.99% and you didn't see it repeat again, yeah, I don't, I don't really have a good explanation as to as to, as to what Oumuamua's origins would be in that circumstance. It would either be some kind of cosmic fluke at a very, very low probability event. I don't think it naturally imply. I don't think it, it leads towards an alien hypothesis in a very satisfying way, necessarily, because... If aliens are sending probes to monitor us, then it, it doesn't really make sense that that would be a one-off event. And if it was a one-off event, then it could have happened at any time in history. What was special about the date when it happened, when it when it visited? So I don't think there's any obvious connection why a lack of repetition would necessarily imply alien or otherwise. It would just be very difficult to to interpret, I think, if that was the case. I don't really have a good answer for that. All right, David, we are out of time. Everybody should check out David's channel, Cool Worlds, on YouTube. And I hope you'll come back. And next time we should talk about exomoons. That sounds great. Thank you for having me on. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction John, Author. Wrong channel. No, it's not. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction Author John Michael Godier, currently hosting Event Horizon and wondering where Anna actually came from. One day I had a tablet computer, the next I had a boss. Very disturbing and be sure- And that's enough of that. YouTuber forever! Like, subscribe, and hit the bell! Sell out. What?